in Kenya, we do not have, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a matrix of measuring, you know, public productivity. But in other countries, you know, like South Korea, and that's why people are encouraged, you know, to be more productive, your wage is pegged on your productivity. And, and so the question is, you know, what are you doing together with other government institutions, you know, like the Productivity Center, you know, to ensure that you come up with this kind of a matrix so that people are paid accordingly uh, to the production or their productivity. Indeed, that, that's a very important part of this wage bill discussion. It cannot be complete without us talking about productivity. Like you rightly said, countries like Korea, uh, we have most of the countries in the Eastern world, they have productivity centers. And these productivity centers es essentially is to drive labor productivity. When you drive labor productivity, then you stand a better chance of improving your, ev your revenue. Now, sticking to the topic on, on productivity in Kenya, as we speak, we actually don't have productivity measures for the public sector. We know that private sector institutions do have measures for their productivity. We have not yet developed those me uh, metrics that would help us to measure productivity in the public sector. So one of the core themes that will be running through the conference in the next three days is exactly about that topic. How do we, as a country, begin to set up the institutions that will allow us to be able to measure productivity and as a commission to then reward that productivity. So that becomes a very critical point of discussion during this conference. Mm -hmm. You know, talking about conference, let's take you back to the year 2014 when the first uh, conference to discuss um, uh, the bloated wage bill was held. And, and I remember back then, you know, President Uhuru Kenyatta and his deputy, you know, were the first to take a, a pay cut, you know, of about 20%. Mm -hmm. And this was supposed to be replicated to all uh, our public officers. We know it's never happened. Where did the back stop? The, the, that conference, let me start with the conference itself, because there was a conference that you in 2014. The outcomes of that conference was really about developing a remuneration and benefits policy for this country that will then guide what the commission does to drive the wage bill to the right proportions. So that work involved, um, the major one was about job evaluation, which you will be aware, and, and most of us are aware that there was a job evaluation of all the public sector jobs in this country, including the state officer jobs. That job evaluation helped the commission to develop job gradings and salary structures. So as we speak today, we have established salary structures for all state officers and for all public officers. What that does when you have established structures, it gives more predictability in how you manage your wage bill, and it also stabilizes how you manage your wage bill. Now, the other one that has been implemented that really has helped the wage bill is having a four-year bargaining cycle. Before that, you were always in collective bargaining uh, mode two after every two years. Now we've got four years. What, what it then helps is there's more predictability in the wage bill because, you know, once you've signed the, the collective bargaining agreement, you've got a whole four-year period to go. Now let me touch on the question you talked about. Yes, the president said, you know, let's cut our pay. When that pronouncement was made, it was made voluntary. However, before that, the commission had actually reviewed the salary structures that was put in place in 2013. That 2017 salary structures did uh, reduce pay to some degree, right? Um, and I wouldn't want to say it was reduced in the sense of I got a pay cut. It was more of how do you consolidate the pay so that you can have more control and avoid a lot of the pay that was not controlled. Right? Uh, there were many allowances that were not controlled. There was a lot of sitting allowances. So, so that is what was managed in that structure. So indeed, in itself, without anyone saying, I'm volunteering for my pay to be cut, there were already in-bill structures to try and curb um, allowances specifically that you cannot attribute to the worth of a job. And that was more with the state officer allowances. Indeed, we haven't touched for the public officers, mm -hmm. and it is one of the areas that we will be looking at getting into in more detail in the next one, two years. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, you know, one of the other issues that, you know, was supposed to be looked into 
or to carry out a lifestyle audit, you know, of all public uh, servants to exactly find out, I mean, what kind of a lifestyle do they live and is it commensurate, you know, with their paycheck? Uh, you know, this has never happened. If it was to happen, do you think it will have any impact on the current wage bill? See, lifestyle audit is more about trying to see whether you are living, whether you can actually account for your lifestyle. And it's more of an agenda around managing the issue of corruption in the country. It's, uh, will it in itself manage the wage bill? Indirectly, yes. Uh, because what we have today, especially when I talk about allowances, it is not very easy to control allowances. Best pay, it's very easy to control. When it comes to allowances, you then find cases where um, some people may claim allowances when they shouldn't pay. Now, those in the end, they do contribute to the lifestyle, but I don't want to say this is the only one. It's probably an indirect correlation. It is one of the factors. Yes, it's mm -hmm. just one of the factors. Mm -hmm. So will it significantly reduce the wage bill? Um, I, I, I don't have this, any statistics to show that, and it's actually not not one of the areas that we are focusing because we know ESCC is actually driving that agenda of lifestyle. In 2015, you know, an audit of all uh, uh, public as well as, uh, you know, state officers and, and, and civil servants, you know, was conducted by the then Ministry of Devolution and Planning. And uh, thousands of workers, you know, were said to be ghost workers. And uh, there, were, there were plans to expand them from the public payroll, and it became a hot pot political potato issue until it stopped. Uh, from where you see it or from where you stand, is this something that you are planning to pick up? What we are planning to pick up is road, it's related, but not the exact the way it was put that there are so many ghost workers. Mm. The issue we are tackling with is do we have established optimal staffing levels at each level of institution, whether it is county government or national government. Indeed, if you are to look at the reports of the Office of Controller of Budget, nearly in all their reports, one of the issues that is raised over and over again is that the number of employees is continuously going up. And that in itself doesn't mean it is wrong or right, but then it should actually be based on an established optimal level, which we don't have today. So that is a concern for the Commission, that if we don't have established, approved, optimal staffing levels, what you then have is the likelihood of recruitment just happening, not necessarily in fact uh, because you require, and you might even not be recruiting the right skills. So that, that's the area which will in fact be part of the discussion in this conference. How do we get to a situation where we have established, approved, optimal starving levels, both in terms of numbers and skill. That way we are sure that we are actually running the public service in an optimal manner. It is efficient, it is effective to deliver the services. Mm -hmm. Why has it that, um, you know, the SRC has never picked up, you know, that report and uh, tried to look through into it and see whether there's anything worth implementing? And of course, right now, at a time when um, uh, uh, the, the, the State Department of Planning's domiciled at uh, your parent ministry, the Ministry of Finance. Now, when it comes to that report, um, and th there was a capacity assessment and rationalization report, mm -hmm. which is normally, you know, said as CABS program, the acronym. That report was very detailed, and it indeed pointed out areas where we needed to look at as a country. Now, when it comes to numbers of employees or structures, or in fact establishments, that is not the mandate of the Commission. It is the mandate of the Public uh, Service Commission. Now, what you will then realize in this conference is we are bringing together all these state actors so that we can have one discussion. Yes, it, it actually contributes to the wage bill. We don't have a direct mandate to control that, but we are brought on board the, uh, the Commission, Public Service Commission. We are brought on board the Ministry of Public Service, Youth and Gender Affairs. Both of them and, the, and all the county governments, we have brought them on board in this conference so that together we can have that conversation and see 
what really stopped us from implementing and what is it that we can do this time round to jumpstart the process and see it to conclusion. The, the other thing, you know, that the CARP reports, you know, uh, 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 really highlighted was that uh, uh, the wage bill for elected officials, you know, was pretty high. And one of the recommendations was uh, how to rationalize these. And uh, when you are being uh, vetted by the National Assembly, you know, parliamentarians, you know, raise the question of what do you plan to do about these? Let me put in perspective. When we talk about the, the salaries, there are two components, actually three components. That is your basic salary. And as I mentioned earlier, those we already have established structures. So all public service institutions today have salary structures advised by the commission. And that addresses the basic pay. Then we have another component, which is about 39% of the compensation in allowances. Those allowances are divided both into remunerative and facilitative allowances. Now, that is the area where um, the commission is now focusing on. There was a study a few years back on these allowances. It actually brought out the issues around allowances. Um, now, as we sit at the commission, having now handled the basic salary, it is our next area of focus. How do we address these allowances that in themselves tend to really, uh, that sometimes they can be uncontrolled, especially when you talk about facilitative allowances. Mm -hmm. Remunerative, you can control to some degree. The facilitative, it is in the hands of quite a number of people to decide. We can set the amount, mm -hmm. but we don't decide when do you pay, how do you pay, and that sometimes tends to create an environment where you can't quite say, I'm in control of managing the wage bill. How then do you control, number one, the hiring spree by counties, and number two, the sporadic uh, 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 remuneration that uh, you know, people at the county level you know, are receiving? You have really managed to deal with the public service, uh, uh, at the public service commission level, but how do you plan to go about the counties? The structure, as I mentioned earlier, that we have uh, advised includes the county governments. So our mandate includes the counties. Everything I've talked about that we have done, including job evaluation, job grading, salary structures, indeed includes the county governments. So the, the, the county governments don't have a problem that is unique that we can say has not been handled. Mm -hmm. The issue that the controller of budgets has repeatedly talked about is the increased in numbers. Of, of employees being recruited at this level. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things is with the devolved system of government, there are certain functions that were devolved. Health is devolved, as an example, right? Um, early childhood education is devolved. As we continue as a country to deliver our Big Four agenda, which is about service delivery, then we've got to extend coverage of those services to ev all the citizens in this country. That of necessity actually means that you will recruit. What is important is, are we recruiting at the right level and are we recruiting the right people? But as a country, we cannot say that because the wage bill is where we are, we have to stop. We have a promise to Kenyans to deliver services. So the challenge is, how do you ensure that as we grow, we grow in tandem with economic growth and revenue growth? Mm -hmm. that, that's the challenge. Mm -hmm. Do we have a stock, you know, at both the national and county levels of how many employees are there, both um, state officers and public servants? Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. We do. I don't have the breakdown at the moment, but the total number is about 800,000. But yes, we do have the breakdown of, mm -hmm. of, of the number of employees mm -hmm. at each level. Have we been able to determine how many people, you know, in the two governments are receiving uh, double paychecks, and uh, others are receiving their checks, though they no longer exist in, 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 the, in the public service? For, for the majority of cases where the payroll is centralized through IPPD, those I can tell you that you will not get what you're describing. But today we do have situations where not all payrolls are centralized. We do have uh, institutions that are running their own payrolls. Uh, and those ones, Yes, we cannot rule out the issue about ghost workers, 
we cannot rule about issues about double payments because it is not centralized for anyone to actually be able to look at. But there is an initiative which is being run to actually try and centralize all those and have an integrated system so that the payroll can speak to the system that runs personnel management. If you integrate the two systems, there will be better controls. So there is a, pro a project going on. Um, once it is implemented, it will give us a better feel of how many people are we actually controlling the payroll. But as is for the majority, it is centralized. But we do have a number of counties that are running their own uh, payrolls. And yes, it is difficult for us to say, is it properly controlled or it is not. As a commission, we do carry out compliance checks um, every year. And it gives us a feel of are there issues we are seeing in, this, in, in, in all these payrolls. So we work with the respective institutions whenever we find areas of non-compliance to get them to a compliance level. Mm -hmm. A country with about 47.6 million people uh, with more than 230 members of parliament and uh, almost 55 uh, are senators and more than 3,000 um, MCAs, if you like it, and uh, about 47 governors. Are you of the opinion that Kenya is an overrepresented country? That's what the Constitution provided. Constitution provided. That's what Kenyans chose as a country. Uh, that's what we chose because it, it was not forced on anyone. We knew when we passed the Constitution that that is what it takes. Now you can then say. Is that overrepresentation compared to other countries? If you take the numbers and compare, say, for example, to United States, yes, the numbers would say you're probably more than you should. But my starting point is that's what Kenyans voted for. If you are given a chance, or if it was within the mandate of our SRC, would you cut this number? I will say from a personal, I don't want to say from a commission perspective because the commission has no mandate to, to, to really look at these issues of, of do you have a bloated system of government. Um, if you look at the number of, and, and I say this is not about a commission view, this is my personal this is view. Personal. This is my personal view. What I would call personal professional view. Yes, personal professional view. Mm -hmm. is if you look at the number of, of counties we have, you look at the number of MCAs we have, if I compare with other countries who are democratic in nature, I would actually say, yes, we are overrepresented. Mm -hmm. And you've worked towards reducing the numbers. It has to go through a constitutional process because no one individual mm -hmm can stand up and say here today, we want to reduce. We've got to respect the democratic space in the country. We've got to respect the institutions we put in place, which basically says that we, if you want to make a change mm -hmm. of that nature, it's got to go through a democratic process, mm -hmm. which is, you know, looking at the constitution. Mm -hmm. The government is most of the time seen as very fond, you know, of organizing meetings, you know, where uh, uh, white papers or blue papers, if you like, you know, are developed, but they are never implemented. The conference that you are hosting, you know, brings together you know different players uh, 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 in, in 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 this country. You know, from economists to planners, you know, to the private sector and public sector. At the end of the day, what should we expect from this conference, so as not to label this conference another, as another fat cut talk talk a uh, talk show? We have looked at, uh, and, and let me begin by saying I agree with you, there are many white papers that are written, but I don't think some of them are implemented, some are, are not. There is an execution gap. And it doesn't mean that we don't know all these things. A lot of things is just about executing properly, executing on time. So what are we doing uh, in this conference? The first thing for us was to acknowledge the fact that we cannot work independently as a commission and come up with very nice policies and say we want to do A, B, C, D. Because our, our mandate touches on, on the role of other parties. So that, that, that begins with a collaborative approach in itself gives some level of assurance that all these actors, all these state agencies will work together towards implementation. But we have not just left it at that. Uh, uh, the outcomes of this conference will actually be policies and strategies that will be developed, and that is part of the concept paper, which from the beginning, all the actors committed to. So we had a concept paper. 
we got it endorsed by all the actors, committing that the outcomes of this conference will be A, strategies and policies that will inform how we manage the wage bill. Number two, we are looking forward to actually developing a sessional paper that would inform remuneration and benefits in Kenya. And thirdly, we are looking at strengthening the legal framework that will, will help us to manage some of the issues that contribute to wage bill, which will include, for example, the labor relations. How do you strengthen the, the legal framework? So those are the three uh, commitments that the actors made from the beginning, but we will remain as the steering body, as SRC, to see that it is implemented. Secondly, this gen the genesis of this conference was the summit. The national government and the counties did realize that we have to address the wage bill. We then took it up as the convener because we are, were the mandated body. The outcomes of this conference will go back to the summit. The summit will then go through all the, the conference resolutions and make a decision. That in itself gives it uh, some level of endorsement that yes, go ahead, we've got the commitment. So what we are trying to do here is to get commitment and buy-in. Thirdly, we are also looking at putting a mechanism in place of a multi-sector team that will be the steering committee that will manage the implementation post the conference. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Lane, because we don't have much time, uh, you know, you're pretty say that when she was, um, this is Ambassador Sarah Serem now in China, uh, when she was being um, uh, 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 grilled uh, over her appointment to be the ambassador for, for the Chinese Republic, uh, she indeed acknowledged that, um, you know, the work of SRC is a very tough job. And a lot of people view SRC as the institution whose mandate is to cut our wages, whose mandate is to cut our emolument and, and uh, remuneration. You are less than one year into, into office. How do you plan to change the image of SRC and make it and give it a new face, you know, before the public uh, eyes? I think the, f the first one is we are finished a year, <laughs> right? We are more than a year oh, now. Really? Yes, 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 we are more than a year. Um, but but to, to get to your question is, first of all, we, we don't apologize that we have a mandate to ensure affordability of the wage bill. That will remain our mandate. Not everybody will be happy with us when we say affordability. Indeed, we get an, a lot of um, institutions coming to SRC to approve pay and the first question we ask is, where is the money to pay, right? Can you show us your, can you show us your, 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 your financials to support that you can pay? And uh, a lot of the time, we find a demand for wage increase, and the institution is actually in the red. They don't have any money. Mm -hmm. So to that extent, I don't want to apologize for that role because mm -hmm. it is our role. Mm -hmm. But indeed, what is important is for, for, for people to understand that our mandate is not just about fiscal sustainability. Mm -hmm. We do look at affordability, attraction. Indeed, the last, uh, the last wage structures that were done, uh, and we'll be going to the next review cycle in the next two years, it actually improved the pay of the public servants. It improved for the civil servants. We had employees who were uh, some categories who, which were below the minimum wage. Right now, we don't have that. Mm. So actually, it's not about cutting. It's also about equity. How do we get equitable pay, but also a pay that is competitive to attract the right skills in the public sector? So the last comment is for me is about we must work together as all the agencies to be able to collaborate in two areas. The first strategy, which is different that we have not done in the past, is driving wage bill from a revenue growth perspective mm -hmm. and the contribution of labor productivity in the discussion. That is a new territory that we are getting into. It will require a lot of effort, a lot of support from many, many actors. Because indeed what we are finding ourselves is, as a commission, we have a mandate to recognize productivity and performance. But we do not set the, 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 uh, the productivity metrics. It's done by the productivity center. Mm. 
they also cannot implement it. It has to be implemented through the Public Service Commission. So that is a new strategy that I want to end with, that apart from what we have been doing, we would like to push the wage bill discussion more towards what is the labor contribution is increasing the revenue so that we, we can increase the fiscal space to accommodate more wages in order for us to deliver public services. Right. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very and, much. Uh, as well put, you have your job well cut out for you. Thank you. And your commission. Thank you. Thank you very much and all the best in your endeavors. Well, Lynn McGitch is the chair of the Salaries and Remuneration Commission and clearly she has her job well cut out for her and of course it's going to be a tough balancing act, you know, to ensure there's a balance between recurrent as well as uh, development expenditure. You have been watching Inside Government right here on KBC Channel 1. My name is O'Brien Kimani. Thank you for your time. We'll see you on Thursday. Have a good night.